and arrangement takes place alongside parallel shifts from a primarily hunting and gathering lifestyle to subsistence based largely on corn agriculture, and from a largely egalitarian to a highly hierarchical political system. Though many of these late prehistoric platform mound sites have been excavated throughout the Mississippi River Valley, I'm gonna focus on a single example that epitomizes these three trends. The Cahokia Mound site is located in Illinois, just across the Mississippi River from the modern city of St. Louis. It's set amid the largest prehistoric concentration of people and monumental architecture north of Mexico. Though estimates vary wildly depending on who you ask, the city of Cahokia and its outlying settlements may have been home to as many as 50,000 people and would have taken more than a day to traverse on foot or close to a, a day to traverse by canoe. Cahokia's record as the most densely populated city in America would have held up until the early 1800s when the burgeoning city of New York would have finally come around to surpassing it. Cahokia itself contained at least 120 mounds and nearby sites now under the cities of St. Louis and East St. Louis would have contained at least 60 more. So I'm now gonna give you a little tour of the ceremonial core of Cahokia and tell you just a bit about what we've learned from excavating at the site. The ceremonial core of Cahokia spans about five square miles and today contains 80 mounds, though undoubtedly it originally included many more that are no longer standing. Part of what is protected today is the Cahokia Mounds World Heritage Site. This is one of the other four, one of the four um, that is a US prehistoric site on that list. Consists of a typical platform mound and plaza layout with 16 mounds surrounding a 46 acre plaza. This entire space was then enclosed within a sizable palisade wall that served to protect the city's central precinct from outside attacks. This wooden palisade is over two miles long and it would have required 15,000 logs, probably 12 to 15 feet in height to construct. More mounds, numerous secondary plazas and other functional and ceremonial features sit outside of the central plaza area. Now we obviously don't have time tonight to examine all of these features, but I do want to tell you about a few of them. So first off, the largest mound at Cahokia, um, which is known as Monk's Mound, named after a Trappist monastery that was built on the mound in historic times, dominates the central precinct from its position at the north end of the plaza. It's the largest earthen construction in the Americas. It's 100 feet tall and consists of five separate terraces and was constructed starting around AD 1000. In its final stage, the upper terrace of Monk's Mound would have supported a building that was probably around 100 by 50 feet in dimension and perhaps as much as 50 feet tall, adding to the height of the mound. The base of the mound covers roughly the area of 14 football fields, um, and it would have required over six million baskets of dirt to be dug up using stone hoes and wooden tools put into baskets, and then hauled by hand, not by pack animals, to the top of this mound. To compare it to the more regularly discussed monuments, Monk's Mound is not nearly as tall, but is much larger at the base than both the Great Pyramid at Giza and the Temple of the Sun at Teotihuacan. While the height of these other monuments is certainly impressive, and I'll give them that, it's important to remember that Monk's Mound was built entirely of earth, and thus didn't rely on the well-stacking properties of stone blocks. Moreover, labor estimates created for the Great Pyramid suggests that over 70% of the time, the energy and the materials went into building the bottom third, while it took only the remaining 30% of effort and resources to complete the construction to the top. So in addition to the huge amount of labor that would have gone into constructing Monk's Mound, the effort put into constructing the other features at the site would also have been massive. For example, the twin mounds, which are up here at the top, sit at the opposite end of the plaza from Monk's Mound and are both at least 45 feet tall. Moreover, the plaza itself, pictured there in the center, would have been an incredibly laborious creation. It encompasses the area of about 35 football fields, and it represents the largest public space conceived of and executed north of Mexico in prehistoric times. It was artificially flattened, which means it also would have required a huge amount of labor. Nearby to this grand plaza, um, Cahokians also constructed a giant solar calendar, which is what's pictured here on the bottom, 
that was rebuilt four times using massive cedar posts during the primary occupation of Cahokia. This monument records the summer and winter solstices, the equinox, and likely also marked important festival dates related to the agricultural cycle. In short, it functioned a lot like Stonehenge, but it was made out of wood. Thanks to a long history of excavation at Cahokia, we know a great deal about the lives of the people who lived in the Mississippi Valley from around AD 1000 to AD 1400. In addition to the mounds that remain conspicuous on the Cahokian landscape today, excavations have uncovered the remains of many houses neatly arranged in neighborhoods along paths or streets. It would have been a busy and a bustling city where people made and used tools, maintained fields of corn and other crops, exchanged, go exchanged goods and ideas, prepared, consumed food, played games, raised children, nursed the sick, buried the dead. I think you probably get the idea. All the things that we do today. Likewise, they would have also struggled with many of the same issues that plague our urban environments today. They dealt with overcrowding, with trash accumulation, with violence, and with crime. And yet, for hundreds of years, they thrived in this place. Their fields provided such an abundance of corn that they had much more than they could eat. This surplus fueled their society, providing goods for trade and exchange, allowing some Cahokians to dedicate their time to becoming skilled artisans and craft specialists, and allowing others to rise to positions of leadership. Cahokia's chief lived on the highest point at the site atop Monk's Mound, and from there he ruled his incredible city and maintained order and harmony among his people. Similarly to the individuals buried in Hopewell Mounds, it's also likely that this chief was charged with maintaining the balance between the upper world and the lower world for communicating with the spirits and for ensuring the survival of the entire Cahokia population. Though we will not discuss them today, a number of other large mound sites date to roughly the same time period as Cahokia and were also ruled by such powerful chiefs. These include Etowah in Georgia, Moundville in Alabama, and Spiro in Oklahoma. And I should point out that all of these sites, along with many of the other ones that I've mentioned today, are open to the public, and I encourage you to visit them. They're even more incredible when you're there. Um, each of these sites has a really inc incredible story um, that's more fascinating than the last. So as you go through them, you'll learn um, so much more if you went through them one by one. Excavation of these late prehistoric mounds also helps to deepen our understanding of the current Native American worldview and the variety of belief systems that are alive and well today in today's tribes. The beautiful and deeply meaningful art created by these people in these communities provides a window into how prehistoric Native American groups understood their world, both the seen and the unseen aspects. And I'm not going to explain all of the artifacts that are up here today, but you can suffice it to say that most of these things relate to a very um, now well understood idea of how the prehistoric people in the Americas viewed their world. And um, hopefully someday I can come back and, and talk more about that. So at the beginning of my talk, I showed this diagram. And I've now told you about the earliest mounds, like those at Watson Break and Poverty Point. I've told you about some of the most ornate examples, like those created by the Hopewell and Effigy Mound building cultures. And then some of the largest constructions, like those at Cahokia. But I would like to end by pointing out something that also differentiates these mounds from even the pyramids at Egypt. And that is that mound construction still actively occurs in the native communities with whom we share the continent. I was lucky enough to attend a mound building ceremony hosted by the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in the mountains of North Carolina while I was in graduate school there. The mound, which is currently about 50 meters in diameter and only at this point about one and a half meters tall, at one time would have been a rather prominent landscape feature. It's been plowed almost to oblivion at this point. Known as Gadua, the Cherokee believe this ancient settlement is the birthplace of their people. After centuries of disease, of warfare, and of exploitation brought on by European contact, Gadua was sold at auction in 1821. Most Cherokee people were then forcibly removed from their land soon thereafter. Those who escaped removal were left in the state of North Carolina with no legal right to hold property. It was not until 1996 that the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians had the opportunity to buy back the land on which Gadua stood. On June 24th, 2011, when I was there, 
173 years after being forced from their land forcibly, Cherokee people undertook their 10th consecutive year of mound building at the site. Mound construction has thus continued with only minor interruptions for nearly 6,000 years in the United States. These mounds represent some of the earliest monumental constructions in the world. Their size and their elaboration rivals even the most famous monuments from other region, regions. And it is for this reason that I wholeheartedly believe that the mounds of the Mississippi Valley could rightfully hold a place on any list of great wonders of the world. Thank you.